um, skunks, raccoons, possums, birds like egrets and herons, they would all eat baby steelhead. So the more abundant the steelhead are, the more of that kind of food there would be to feed all those birds and everything. So yeah, it's we haven't measured it, but it's probably affected other animals that would have normally eaten steelhead when they were, you know, like back in the days when Native Americans here and steelhead were abundant. How big do, how like big has, how big does steelhead get? Um, they get bigger north of here in Northern California and Oregon, but down here, uh, most of them are between, uh, let's say, 15 to 25 inches. And there's some get to be as big as 35 or 37 inches, which is almost three feet. But most of them are, are two feet or big, two foot long or bigger. So some get 35 to 37? Seven, yeah, some get 35 to 37. And it's based on how big the river is and how much food there is in the river. So the rivers south of Oregon and Northern California are a little smaller down here. And the amount of food in the river isn't quite as much, so the fish aren't going to get as big. Um, how, like, does, does the, um, steelhead population, like, does it affect, like, fish, like, the, like, the fisheries? Yeah, it affects the fishermen. They used to be, um, a very popular fishery on the Carmel River through, I, I didn't get here, I wasn't here then, in the 1980s, so that's, uh, 30 years ago. And there are pictures, I have a couple of, uh, photo boards, I don't know if they're still in the building which shows people, you know, lined up along the open banks of the Carmel River fishing. And uh, some of the guys who own um, some of the small hotels out in Carmel Valley, the little motels and hotels, they told me that in the winter during the steelhead season, they used to have a lot of business from that, that those people used to come and stay in those hotels because the winter, you know, the rainy season is normal, not, not the normal tourist season for this area. But they got a lot of winter business from those fishermen in the old days that's not there anymore because the fishing's not there. So, yeah, money money has been lost and as the steelhead fishing got worse and worse along the central coast here a number of fishing stores that used to exist in Capitola and Santa Cruz to sell things to the sports fishermen have closed and never reopened so there's only one fly fishing store left and it's in Carmel Valley that's the only one between San Luis Obispo and San Francisco all the rest of them closed there used to be more little fishing stores but as the fishing gets bad and the fishermen don't fish obviously the business is closed so like how far how far like inland do do the um do the steelhead go? Well, like and do they stay? In, do they sometimes stay in lakes, or do they always go up to the? Ocean? They'll stay in the freshwater environment if they get trapped there. So like in a year that dries up quickly, and they were maybe going to go out next week, and now the lagoon closes and the river dries back, and they get stuck upstream, they'll try and survive until the next year and go out the next year. But that's hard for them to do. It's hard for a big fish, right? to, you know, a three foot long fish to stay in a little tiny creek and find enough to eat to live to the next year. And maybe not get picked off by a, a fox or a coyote or a possum or something like that coming down to eat it or a bear. Um, so uh, but normally they try to go back out to the sea after they spawn. And uh, regular salmon, as you guys may know, al almost all of them die in the river. They die after they spawn and they don't feed when they get to fresh water. Well, steelhead are the same. They don't feed once they get into fresh water. But we estimate at least 20-25% of them turn around and go back out to the ocean. So they're the only salmon type fish that has a large fraction of them survive spawning and go back out. Um, um. And how far do they go? Uh, in this area of the coast, the farthest upstream that they've ever gone and that they're still seen once in a while is all the way up by Santa Mar Margarita Lake in San Luis Obispo County. Wow. So they go past Salinas, they go all the way by Greenfield and uh, Chular and King City and all the way up and end up up there. But they oftentimes can't make it up there because we as humans have modified the river and pump water in different ways. Mm -hmm. So they can't always make it up there. But once in a while they do and they, they regularly make it to the Arroyo Seco. Do you guys know where that is? That's a river that empties into the Salinas River near Greenfield. So they regularly make it up the Salinas River to Greenfield and then up the Arroyo Seco to the campgrounds and stuff there. And sometimes all the way to Santa Margarita. Wow. Long way inland. And of course the steelhead in the Central Valley, they make it all the way to the base of Shasta Dam and to rivers below Shasta Dam way up by Redding in Northern California. So they make it a long way inland. Um, and here it says um, for a few years there's um, zero. Right. 
Um, that was those oftentimes are periods of drought. Like seventy six and seventy seven was a drought, and eighty seven to ninety one was a drought. Some of the zeros in there are because nobody was counting, uh, but some of them are because there was absolutely nothing there. Okay, what's a zero point four? I mean, it's like let's see. Let me look at it there. That's a that's a number of fish per hundred feet of stream. So that means. If I walked 100 feet of stream, I would have seen less than one fish. Or roughly, I would have had, with 0.4, you know, to make 0.4 into 1, you'd have to multiply it by 2.5. So I would have had to walk 250 feet of river in 1989 to see one fish. That's how low the abundance was. Whereas in 19, what's this here, 19, that's the year 2000, every 100 feet I walked, I would have seen 183 fish. So that's that's what that represents. Whoa. That's a lot. And you can see the weather here is very is quite variable, so the abundance in the fish is quite variable. They they alternate between boom and bust years, you know, doing really well, not so well, really well, not so well. That's relatively normal. And they've survived uh, these fish have been around a long time. They've survived ice ages and they've survived long periods of historic drought before human beings were messing with the river they managed to survive those those periods so like when the steel when there's the steelhead trout is there less of the animals that eat them that eat the steelhead trout we don't know don't know that and uh nobody's monitoring directly all the other fish that may have eaten steelhead like when you see the pictures on National Geographic and stuff about the grizzlies up in Alaska and British Columbia, they heavily depend upon the salmon that come in for a few months in the winter. That's how they put on a lot of their body fat. Probably in this area, the steelhead were just another food source. In other words, when, when there were less steelhead, the animals that ate steelhead shifted to something else, and nobody knows how that affected anything because we're not carefully wa measuring and monitoring all the other animals that eat steelhead. Nobody has a, a possum survey, for example, or a skunk survey, or a bear survey. They actually have a bear survey going, but it's on a very limited level. Um, is there any questions that you think, like any stuff that you think we need, we should know, like about? No, uh, I think that the, the primary thing is the reason the steelhead and even the red-legged frogs, that's another one that's on the river, and they're listed uh, under the federal laws, just like the steelhead are. It, it's that basically we uh, we in California have gone, you know, have you heard, guys heard the term carrying capacity um, for animals? It means kind of like how much uh, food, energy, space, habitat, shelter is available for any animal. And that defines how many of them you can have. Well, as we human beings chew up the space and chew up the water and, you know, have to m mow down forests for lumber to build homes and we have to... Uh, open up land to raise food to feed ourselves and all that that takes that space and food and land away from the wildlife so when I was born in California there was about um, six to eight million Californians when I graduated high school there was 12 to 14 million Californians I think today there's 38 million so in my lifetime what's that we've gone up almost six times as many Californians and of course they need water they need farms, they need houses, they need roads, and as we do that, we take the habitat away from wildlife, which is why people try and, there's two things we do, we try and set aside land for wildlife, and then we also try to use less resources, meaning we try to keep more of us around using less water, and that's what we've done on the peninsula. Around the state, they use 120 to 180 gallons a day of water per person. And the Monterey Peninsula, we use around 58 to 60 gallons a day. So we use one half to one third. Well, what does that mean? If you're using one half to one third of what you used to use, you can accommodate more people in the area without drying up the rivers or without taking everything away from the fish. So all over California, we're going to have to, as we as population continues to grow, because it's going to continue to grow, we have to learn to be more efficient with energy, more efficient with water, more efficient with space, more efficient with food, and all those things. Otherwise. We just have to keep bulldozing everything to make more space for people. So we have to get more efficient in order to leave space for wildlife. And and in this area, we have got more efficient on water. So we've done that part pretty well. And I was, I was giving you a picture. This is a, this is a blown up, but this is what a, a steelhead that wants to go to the ocean looks like. It's called a smolt. So 
the fins are black tip it has like the salt and pepper along there that's a that's a big adult that one's like three feet long so the baby looks almost like the adult this guy's only about six to eight inches long and um he's had a hormones change and he's ready to go to sea because think about it, can you drink salt water no no i can't either and so when these steelhead are babies they live in fresh water and they can handle it if you throw them into the ocean before they look like this just like you tossed us out there they have the same problems we do they can't absorb all the salt they can't function but within a few weeks to a couple of months they make a hormonal change and they change colors and they change from uh, i didn't get your picture of a baby i have one in here to this and then this is they're ready to go in the ocean and now they can keep the salt out of their body and absorb the water, filter the salt out, and they can live in salt water. Um, so there's two pillars an adult, and there's a couple pictures of that for you. Let me see if I can find a picture of a juvenile. Wait, so, um, go ahead. They go through another change when they go back in the water? No, when they're adults, amazingly enough, they're able to make the change both directions without any problem. They only have to make the change when they're young, when they're babies. But, um, And you can take those back to teachers or students or something if you want to. So here's another big adult. How big is that one? That one's smaller than that one. This one's a two foot or so, and that one's a. That and that's the juvenile. Yep. Yeah. Oh. So this looks like a trout, right? A baby trout, yeah. and that's what a steelhead is. Steelhead and rainbow trout. They still cannot tell them apart genetically. They may be different or they may not be different, but so far they can't tell that they're different. So what they think is that our coastal rainbow trout along the whole Pacific coast from uh, Alaska to Baja, California, they have um, a, a strategy to survive in this area. And what it is is some stay in the freshwater all their life, and some go to sea and biologists haven't proven this but what they think is going on right now is if things are good and you're growing quickly and you put on enough body fat to be healthy because body fat is how fish measure your health then if you look around and you go whoa it's pretty crowded here I'm pretty big maybe I'm five inches long and I've got good body fat I'll my genetics are telling me take the risk to go to the ocean so I leave now, if I'm small, I'm three inches, and I'm skinny, and I don't have much body fat, and maybe things aren't very crowded, I'll go, well, I'm small, I don't have a lot of body fat for a big journey, there's not a lot of fish around here to compete with me, I'm going to stay here. And the other thing they found out, though, is if I grow really fast, if I'm big, I'm eight inches long, and I have a lot of body fat, and there's lots of other of these little ones around me, I'll go, well, plenty of food, my cousins, <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, I'm the big fish, I'm dominant already. I don't have to go to the sea, and there's plenty of my cousins around here to eat if I get hungry, and if there's not enough insects for me to eat, because that's primarily what they eat is insects. But steelhead of all the salmon are the most, uh, what's the word for it? forgot the term. They eat their own more than any other salmon. Uh, cannibalistic. Cannibalistic, right. I was trying to think of the word. That's right. So they're the most cannibalistic s salmon. So if you're really big, and you're dominant and you're bigger than all the other fish in the area and there's plenty of other fish to eat and there's plenty of insects to eat you won't go to the ocean if you're small and skinny and scared and it's not too crowded and there's enough to eat you won't go to the ocean but in that middle range you're medium sized you've grown pretty good you're you're fat it's crowded maybe the food isn't too good in the area you'll take the risk to go to the ocean feed in the ocean for two to three years and then come back as an adult so they think that the steelhead are betting two different strategies and then that way, if there's a really bad drought and nothing happens in the fresh water, there's the guys out in the ocean. And if the ocean's really bad, like I told you, for five or six years and things aren't going well out there, well, then there's the guys in the fresh water. So they're covering all their risks. So they're, they're, they're managing their risk, which is without, why without human beings, they didn't go extinct here. Because there's always been droughts and there's always been floods. But they managed to make it through all those because they had two different strategies that were running at the same time. And splitting their risks. Wait, um, are there some? Uh, are there like even numbers? So like, there's um, like not well, like. The even numbers of the freshwater and the and the ones yeah, like, that go so to sea. Are they close to each other or? Is we don't know. We don't know okay. about that. I don't. I, I can't answer. We really don't know. I can't tell you. So, steelhead trout and and rainbow trout, they're, they're they kind of can't tell them apart. So, but don't rainbow trout like they don't always go. They don't 
go, so a lot of them don't go back to don't go to the ocean. Correct. So yeah. Stay right. So it's coastal rainbow trout. So what the ones way up in the Sierras, they may not do this. Yeah. And so, and the ones in Colorado, right? Because obviously they can't get to the ocean from Colorado. And there's rainbow trout all over the West Coast: Colorado, Utah, Arizona, mm -hmm. Nevada. I don't. I think maybe even maybe even New Mexico. I can't remember. But all over the West Coast, there's rainbow trout. But the ones along the coast, whose rivers connected to the ocean, they have this double strategy: some stay and remain as trout, and some stay and go as steelhead. And so, of course, this is like a rainbow trout, right? Yeah. yeah. Big, big freshwater rainbow trout. Which these, they kind of look the same. Correct, they do. Just so this guy grows up to look like this if he stays in fresh water and he loses those marks. Or he loses those marks and he grows up to look like that. Or and this. Yeah. And he goes from this to this to this. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So he either goes to this to this. Right, exactly. Yeah. Or exactly. this to this. Right. Like right. Or, yeah. or this, exactly. Yeah. This is a red-legged frog. You guys have seen pictures oh. of those, right? Not really. They call them red. They see the red belly, yeah. and under the leg is red. And the reason they are not abundant is everybody liked to eat them. <laughs> and so the 49ers, the gold miners, would eat massive amounts of those frogs for frog legs. It was cheap and easy food. And then they ran out of red-legged frogs, so they brought bullfrogs to California. So that's why we have bullfrogs in California. They normally weren't here. Oh, so they're not native? No, they're not native. And don't the bullfrogs eat the red legged Correct, they do. So that's a problem, too, for red legged frogs, is we brought in these bullfrogs for the, to raise as food for the 49ers who got used to liking frog legs, and it became a California thing to eat frog legs. And then now we, we not only did we you know fish or harvest these down to a low level, but we brought in the bullfrogs to compete with them. I'm looking for a bullfrog. My neighbor had a pet bullfrog. Oh, they make good pets. Nothing wrong with and you guys, will be, the, sometimes we see these in the river. They're lampreys. Have you ever heard of those? No. They're a very ancient fish. They're even older than steelhead. And they have a sucker mouth with teeth. And they latch on and hold on to a fish and catch a free ride in the ocean. And then they come back to spawn in the river just like the steelhead do. And some years we see lots of them. Some years we see very few. Do they eat the some types of lamprey do, they're like, quote, a parasite, meaning they chew up the tissue of the fish they're on, or they, they you know, let the, get the blood out of the fish slowly and live a little bit off that blood. Pacific lamprey, as far as anybody knows, they make a wound when they grab on, but they're not really chewing on the fish, they're just hitchhiking.